Hello. There he is. <laughs> What's going on? Hi, Dave. Hello, Rob. Um, What's going on? Where do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many places we could start, but um, maybe for a little context, um, I'm just another Dave, and I started a podcast recently, kind of on a whim, and it has three streams. One is meditations, one is interviews of other Daves, and this is the inaugural interview of someone not named Dave. A non-Dave. Yes. Big moment for all of us. And then the third stream is songs. And I thought it might be I, I actually I didn't plan this at all. It's just um, I thought it might be interesting to make mention of something that a lot of people probably don't know about you, and that is that you were in a band in college. And I think if I remember correctly, it was called Blank Ted Bundle or something. Uh, like there have this. been a number of bands. The band you're referring to, Fun <laughs> Bundle. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm trying to keep them straight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this uh, this creativity uh, has been in your bones for a long time, and I uh, I was uh, at Mars Hill went uh, for for a little while, and that's when I first started learning from you. There we go. I've actually never had a conversation with you before, but I feel like I have, you know. And um, <laughs> that's funny. And I think I heard you say on an interview recently that uh, you 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 don't tend to like read fiction um, yourself. I love fiction. You love think. fiction. Okay, I heard that so wrong. Give me Sorry. a novel. Um, I but a number of people about the new book described it as science fiction, and I haven't really read science fiction, so I oh science you, fiction. Like, so what other than these spaceships and what makes this science fiction? And I was like, don't ask me. <laughs> it wasn't a claim I was making. <laughs> There's like this weird world collide too, because when I was there at Mars Hill, I was in a two piece band called Tommy tomorrow, which was a, um, we came up with the name before we realized that it was actually a comic strip in the sixties that only lasted Ooh. for like a year and a half or something. Tommy tomorrow, like one of those futuristic type things. Yeah. Yeah. It has very similar vibes to your latest book. Um, Where Did You Park Your Spaceship? Awesome. Um, which I entirely loved. And I have so many questions. Fire um, away. But I must also say my wife loves fiction and science fiction way more than I do. She wishes she could have been here. She has, she has lots of questions. She says hello. Her name's Lindsay. Um, but I thought I'd uh, start off with a satirical question, if you don't mind. Okay. So we all know you for many laps to have been a pastor, a, a teacher, a speaker, an author, and now this is your first fictional novel, right? So it's a second, given... uh, it's a second, second one. Oh, right. Cause what was the first? Millones cojones. Oh, that was a, that was a goodie. Um, so, given your robust spiritual and authoritative knowledge and accolades for understanding the deepest nature of the universe, both in this life and the life to come, get ready. The question the question's coming. Tell us, where do people go after they die, Rob? And please be specific, like, which planet specifically do they go to? We want to know. We, we must know. Is it Fari, Pino, Morkiba, Pua, Wuyuk, Zikis, York, Hitesh, Pegs, Furtis, or maybe some other planet yet not revealed? Um, and if you, maybe, if you can't answer this question, then I really don't see why we need to go That's on with funny. this interview. They go somewhere where that isn't an interesting question. <laughs> awesome. Next question. Where did the game Forky come from? I know. 
Yeah. I can say that about the entire story. Have you played it before? Mm -hmm. oh, All made yeah. up. Yeah. I don't, and I, I have no idea. I can't even think of a re frame of reference. Huh. Or like a thing that... It, um, yeah, completely out of nowhere. <laughs> and the meaning of piddle? Is that to be revealed? Did I miss the meaning? Well, that's the beauty, isn't it? Seems like people just put whatever they want on it. Ah, uh, okay. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the fun of creating a world. Is <laughs> why would I ever get in the way of your interpretation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what inspired you to write a book about uh, spaceships and planets? Yeah. Um. Let me just. Let me just do this real fast here. Get a little light on the situation. Uh doesn't really creation for me is very mysterious uh something arrives and asks to be given expression and then i follow it so sometimes i interview it uh mm -hmm. what are you what do you want to be what is the shape some ideas some things literally i'll is this a book a play is this a episode? Is this a tour? Is this a what is this, a painting? What is this? Yeah, it's very mysterious. And it uh, asks, it's almost like it shows up and is like, make me, or it shows up in, in like immaterial and asks to be made material. You know what I mean? Like words, paragraphs, color, shape, like that. Hmm. So yeah, this one arrived in the middle of the night. The guy was asking the guy, where'd you park your spaceship? It had like a, somewhere between fast asleep and wide awake. Somewhere in between there. And I remember just laughing like, God, that's so great. Like, how does this guy, immediately I was asking it questions. Well, how does this guy feel about this question? Well, how does the other guy feel about asking the question? And it was like, followed it. Hmm. What's his name? Oh, Joe Tud. What's his name? Dean Gruberis. Where are they? Furtis. Why? Why are they on that planet? It was like, you know, off we went. <laughs> mm -hmm. For days and weeks and months. <laughs> Years? Or like months? Uh, first draft. Yeah, first draft was probably eight months. Okay. That's a big book. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it was much longer than the draft you hold there in your hands. Huh, interesting. Because <laughs> you always, it's like, there are a number of things, hundreds of pages that are written. You just get it all out, and then you go, okay, so what's needed for the story and what was actually for me? It's almost like some of it I'm just giving myself backstory. Huh. It's very, it's very, very fascinating how it works. Yeah. One of my favorite lines was, we contain multitudes. <laughs> What, what does that mean? Doesn't Bob Dylan have a great song? Bob, there's a Dylan song. I think, I think it has a line I contain. Multitudes. Right, right. Think, I mean, you could read that many levels. Feelings, anger, rage, joy, euphoria, sadness, lostness, bewilderment, connection. Hmm. Think of all the things any one of us is carrying around at any given moment. Have there been like themes that have been bubbling up from feedback from people who who've read, like some some top top things that continue to, to rise? Yeah, a lot. yeah. Everybody wants to talk about the grief and sadness. It's like just below, like a millimeter below the whole thing. Sometimes above the surface, but otherwise, it's like just below the surface. Hmm. Feeling. And then the feeling as he, the main character, begins to feel that as the reader, you're, he's telling you about, he's beginning to feel, but you, the reader, are starting to feel. Like, so a number of people talking about that, the journey with him and why it has the effect it does. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. That's there's a lot there to talk about. <laughs> mm. So yeah, the, like you you mentioned, like wonder, joy, um, mind. Well, not not sure if you mentioned, but mindfulness, finding purpose, and like, are you obviously you're doing like these podcast interviews, but how are you seeing other forms of discussion happening? Oh, I'm just sitting. Uh, yeah, I just sit in the garage and talk to people like you, which is fascinating. Because in some ways, I have my experience with the story and the writing of the story. I was having my own experience with it, and then to have it go out into the world and have other people read it, and then the two of us talking about it, and and the number of people who have seen things that I didn't see in it is just the best. So many people see things and are like. You know about mm. this and this, how this relates to this, and what the what? <laughs> <laughs> it's just awesome. <laughs> so fun, so fun. It's fun to watch you having fun, man. It really is. Um, hmm. You often challenge conventional religious wisdom. Um, would you say that this book aims to expand ideas about God and faith for people in any way, or, or would you say it's just, just a good story? Consciously, that was never an intention. I was just following the story. And if you did want to do that, it would ruin it if you set out to do that. Hmm. Like the nature of a story is telling a story that moves you and then that's why I like when you see a movie, if it's if the point, if there's a point, you're like, ugh, so heavy handed, right? Like if you if the if you can feel the writer trying to get right. you <laughs> to tell her, you're like gross. Yes. That's why so much Hallmark. religious art is such rubbish. For like right. people just because it's they're trying to get you to think or feel or believe something. Right. It's very invasive and it's just gross. That's why some people get so turned off. So Yeah. And 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 yet great art does. Like you walk out of Oppenheimer and you're like, oh, God, give me a couple of days, give me a month to recover. So it somehow surrenders the need to make any points hmm. because it's just being true to the story. And then that's the very act on behalf of the storyteller that evokes within you so much feeling and reflection and discussion. Yes, I distinctly felt that. Like, there's no character that was modeled after someone I know, because that's almost like a trap door, like a kill switch in telling the story. Um, I, like, wrote in a friend. There's one friend, but that's because he actually did a thing that is in the book. But otherwise, if you're trying to, like, you know what I mean? Like, write in something familiar, it, it would just, it like, it, it's like a garden hose, just crimps it. It's almost like you have to just stay so present to who, for me, the experience was, okay, who do we meet next? What happens next? Who, who is that? What's their name? Who are they? Like, what do they say? What's this person say in response? You know what I mean? Like it was mm -hmm. just this very tender, earnest, fully present. And then what happens next? Oh, and oftentimes I'm surprising myself. Oh, you're right. I guess that is what happens. Yeah. I thoroughly loved the dialogue. Uh, I, f I, I think at first I found it a little bewildering because I was trying to wrap my head around what exactly was going on. But then, then, then over time, like things started to piece together. Yeah. Good. It's like a world. Like it takes a minute. Yeah. Takes a minute to understand the speak the language of the world. So, what do you say to your critics who think the book's message is too abstract or complex from a Who's former that? pastor and teacher of the Word of God? That isn't something that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, this one. Um, 
I happen to be in a quite a liminal space right now myself. Mm -hmm. And so this concept of liminal spaces, which so many of us find ourselves in uh, during these yeah. times, um, how much of the book is influenced by your own personal spiritual journey and shifting perspectives? I don't know how anything I would do isn't. It's like oxygen. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would just say, yeah, of course. It's all personal. Everything's personal. Everything we do. Yeah. Everything's shaped by everything else. Everything is everything. <laughs> A friend of mine says everything is its very own self. So, Ooh. oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's. That hurts always, my brain. There's always only ever a like a a pursuit, a curiosity, a an exploration, and I often probably couldn't even articulate what exactly I was following or exploring or going after. Hmm. All the work was always deeply personal. It's like sorting something out. You know what I mean? It was always like a. The great artist Robert Irwin talks about pursuing a line of inquiry. At some level, the whole thing is just always pursuing pursuing a line of inquiry. And how we know if we found it, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Don't ask me. <laughs> and then you do find things, and you get answers, and that creates new questions, and then you follow those questions. That's how it's always felt. When you were... There at Mars Hill, I was at some level, it's like a giant art project to me. Yeah. It never, it never to me, it, running an institution was never that compelling. It always felt like a giant experiment. Like, what happens when people come together? What's possible? What, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I think it's that's why. That sort of wide eyed wonder and awe to it. Yeah. What's this? What are we learning here? What's that about? Is that like childlike faith it, the the book velvet elvis you talked if i remember about being curled up in a closet at mars oh you, oh you, and, yeah yeah sitting, sitting in a chair before one of the services just so burned out so tired just like what is the point of this <laughs> i can't even I, tell you like reading that that at the time that i did i was teaching high school science and i was like I had this small little bathroom in my uh, in my classroom, and I, I would like on my prep period. Some days I would just go in there and feel like I was gonna hurl, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, talk about liminal space. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that just—I I think your, your transparency and honesty about being on a journey and and the artist's way of listening to what the creative spirit wants to say in the world through you is what has really kept me following your story um mm. journey and it's i i just appreciate your work man a great deal more than i can say that's great yeah and liminal space it's a normal part of it. It's like seasons end. Yeah. Chapters end. New ones begin. It's happening all around us. Yes. With trees and leaves and our bodies and cells and sense a dying and then a birth and ending and a beginning, a graduation and then a new life curriculum. It's like it is, it is how the whole thing actually works. And so in the modern world, you can see how many people divorced from creation, disconnected from nature, yet separated from this very fundamental truth to how the whole thing actually works. So it's like, oh my God, this job. Yeah, it's just a job. Right. Yeah, and, and then in those fears, people often go to scarcity. We, we yes. like, there won't be enough as opposed to, uh, probably other ways to pay the bills <laughs> like there's probably other schools my kid could go to we could live in a different apartment house studio flat hmm. bungalow back house shack shed cottage <laughs> cabin <laughs> like you just start 
even, planet. Right. Even the person who's like, well, I got to put a roof over my head. I don't know. That's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I do. I got to put a roof over my head. Well, <laughs> I wonder if you just Googled jobs in which housing was provided. Like you just think about how many assumptions people have hmm. that you're like, I don't know. I know people who housing came with their, I just met a guy the other day, housing came with his job. So you just think about even the most basic sort of things people hmm. live with, but like, you know, I got to feed my family. Actually, what about a job in a setting where meals were provided like a dining hall or maybe it was an <laughs> academic setting or a camp or a academy. Right. Like you just, you go through how often the mind hmm. has already solidified and calcified around, well, this is just reality. And, and uh, actually, no. People buy sprinter vans and drive around the country with young kids for a year. Mm, now we're talking. Like, you just think about how many ways that reality gets set in a person's head. And they're like, <laughs> well, this is just reality. And a bunch of people, enough people agree with this is, you know, this is how it is. Uh, no. <laughs> Other people don't have that same furniture arrangement in their head. Right. <laughs> so that's uh, if, going back to you. What are your two questions ago? For me and for my family, the endless realization of how much of what we call reality is constructed and it can be taken apart. Hmm. We can hmm. navigate it some other way. Hmm. So, oh, even this, even this is an assumption. Even this is a, a, a furniture arranged in my head in a particular way. Are you ready for another question? <laughs> I love oh. how you set it up. So, <laughs> fire away. What would you say is the core spiritual need you see in people today? Mm, I don't know. Do people need anything? Seems like we have everything we need. Mm. Look, that's the need. Some of you, that's the need. See the, like, look, notice the pure self, the, the self, the essence of the self, the I. Like, there, there's a Dave who's having an ex, some, some sort of experience of Daveness, some I. Think about yes. meditation. Meditation, you're calm. You have some sense of I, and you have some sense of being. There's somebody in here somewhere is having some sort of experience. But then you meditate and become aware of a, a greater thing that is having an experience of me. When you think about all, hmm. all of that direct observation, experience, witness. You become to see that peace is your true nature. But the, the, the ways we torture ourselves in the war and the conflict, all that comes from attaching and clinging to different that can be let go. I just wonder if the, the core need is you're good. You don't have no, you have no needs. <laughs> wow. If you think about every major wisdom tradition, no being who has ever held up as getting it or seeing something new or expansion or enlightenment, whatever, awakened, whatever. Nobody hmm. was ever like, yeah, try harder. <laughs> right. Or like no one ever came down the mountain after being in the cave for seven years and said, yeah, well, actually we really are screwed. Like, <laughs> I have an episode only, coming up. I'm calling competitive yoga. Right. No one, no yogi ever was like, I'm like, kick that yogi's ass. <laughs> it never, you'd be like, oh, that, that yogi can't help me. That yogi's trapped in the same. <laughs> so that's, this is the power of the human experience is playing out all these games where we're like, I need that. I, if, I, well, if only I had that. Right. If only I was over there. If only I could be. And right. then you play it out only to realize, actually, I'm okay. Just okay. right now, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. Hmm. That's, that's, that's the power right there. And then it always takes you back to breathing. Yes. That's the thing to just always go back to. Wow, there's something infinite, indestructible, eternal indomitable that is 
as close as my breathing. It is my breathing. My breathing is it. How come when I just pay attention to my breathing and I'm still, I experience something that is boundless, timeless, eternal, infinite, indestructible? Hmm. <laughs> Aren't we funny how we make up all these things to torture ourselves with? Punch, <laughs> as, I, as I like to say, we punch ourselves in the face and then go searching for fists. Hmm. <laughs> like we, <laughs> the mind creates all this. I should, I need to, I'm supposed to. Really? Are you sure about that? Oh, you're right. I guess I don't. Mm -hmm. Oh, look. Peace. <laughs> I have a brother, Aaron, in Grand Rapids, who, uh, he's a pastor and a counselor. And he wanted me to ask you a question. So this mm. question is in what did you decide to ask the question or did you I did I, I don't know I'll decide I'll I decide in a moment I, d I decided to ask the question um <laughs> I did um in what does in what uh, are our family or of origin sorry I'm I'm not familiar with the terminology so much but how does our family of origin affect the way we see God and the world. And what role do you think this plays in some of the deconstruction of our faith? He's a counselor and he's asking that? Yeah. Seems like that would be what he would do all day. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the work, isn't it? Isn't that sure. fascinating how we never stop learning about where we come from and how it shapes us? Yeah. And once you see that linear time is one expression of time and that memory itself is warped and wobbly, how something can be a long time ago and you remember it very clearly and something not that long ago you can barely remember. Yeah. And then you become to realize, oh, God, something happened when I was seven. All of a sudden you, you see how it shaped you. You like pull that strand four or five decades later. Yeah, this is the, this is the when you stop fighting that, Hmm. what your brother's talking about and you start enjoying the search and the hunt let's see what else let's see how else I was shaped let's see how else my origins played a role in me becoming this me hmm. yeah and it's not nostalgic or being stuck in the past it's a different understanding of time in which you see how multi-layered and complex and fascinating the human being is Oh yeah, I'm. Just, I yeah. I just today was having a conversation with somebody who was helping me understand something that happened when I was very young. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that's where I came. From. Like endlessly, it feels like endlessly pulling a thread, and then you just pull it back farther and farther. Oh yeah, you think about how many. Think about well, just take how many people start with politics, economics, education what people mean by success and how many people we picked up think of how many ways so many people right now were taught the world works that the world no longer works that way right like like do the people who go to the best colleges and get the air quotes best jobs are they the people who are the happiest no okay is is what is first and foremost required in what we know to be politics to have a like the heart of a public servant is that when people use the word public like politics what they're referring to is people who have a strong noble honorable sense of public service mm -hmm. like think of how many things are like veered way off think about academia and how yeah. tribal and shockingly narrow and close-minded it actually <laughs> is so like all this stuff is so many giant systems are melting down. Literally, our economic system, we have extensive, we literally have the data, but just over and over again, wealth is more and more concentrated on just a few people. Like the, these systems. Yeah, so it's feeling like something's going off a cliff. Yeah. Yeah. And then you talk to like my kids, they just like have no allegiance something that doesn't work you know yeah, I mean? right or even you just think about like my kids would be like yeah we grew up with like the earth in crisis 
So the people in right. charge were unable to do something so basic. So, oh yeah, this whole thing. Yeah, who knows? What an extraordinary time to be alive. <laughs> True that. <laughs> so if readers take one key lesson or takeaway from this book, what would you hope that well, would I'm be? I'm not aware that there are any lessons and I have absolutely no hopes because I would just love to be, I just love to be constantly surprised by what people saw in it. Yeah, and a lot of people have had like very strong, they're like, it was so terrifying and strangely vital and, and enlivening. Yeah. And so many people were like, architecture, economics, uh, urban planning, uh, ecology. They're like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like it was about like 24 things. <laughs> right. Which is just delightful to me. <laughs> and some people just want to hone right in on a particular character and something they said and other people like see these larger themes that's what's so wondrous about it to me after years and years of teaching which was this is the point this yeah. is point a this is point b this is what i'm saying here's another example here's another example here's what i just said <laughs> said slightly differently that's what was so uh god so wondrous about writing this where did you park your spaceship was just to set all that set aside. It's like, it's like a musculature that I could just set aside, just yeah. follow the story and see where it went. All right. I got one more question for you that I wasn't planning on asking, but I'd like to end with this. And that is because I've got three boys myself. The oldest, oldest is 12 mm -hmm. and I have twin boys who are 11. And Whoa. I'm curious, what about the, uh, kid readership of this book. Have you, have you heard about that? Like, do, do you get feedback from I've kids? I've heard people say that their kids are reading it. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. And I love, especially with the story. Stories find there's no, like the, there's like barrier entry gets pretty low. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's a story. Yeah. Enjoy. I'm looking greatly forward to them coming across. I think it's way at the beginning, the the earth, the past earth being called brown ball in the classroom mm -hmm. and the kids are just mm -hmm. laughing. I just can't wait for them to, 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 to read that. So <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That is great. Rob, you are a blessing to me. Always thank have you. been. And thank you for talking with me about this book and, uh, I hope that um, lots and lots of people uh, get the joy of reading it very soon if they Thank haven't you already. Thank for having me on the podcast. Good question. Tell your brother I said hi. Will do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Peace and love and spaceships. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.